welcome to Polygamy, What Love Is This? Have you ever thought about that question, Polygamy, What Love Is This? I thought about it often as I was growing up in the polygamy group because I didn't see a lot of love around me. I did see a lot of pain and loneliness and silent suffering. And I wondered, where was the love? Frankly, I have seen more forms of mental and emotional abuse from polygamy than I did see of love. And I also saw more um, mind control than I saw of love. I'm Doris Hansen and I was raised in a polygamy group and I did see a lot of mind control take place and very little love. The groups often use uh, mind controlling techniques and tools to hold their people in line and to keep their membership active. The tools that they use, they use very well. It is fear and guilt and shame. And those tools they use to keep people in control, and that's how they use their mind control. They teach us that the only way to heaven is living polygamy. They teach us that God is pleased with polygamy, but the opposite is true. And when we're raised from the cradle to believe these things, then when we grow up, we believe them. This program is to help people understand polygamy, what it is and what it is not. This is a live telephone call-in program, and we invite you to call in and ask your questions and express your concerns as we go through the program. We'll open the telephone lines a little bit later for you to call your questions in. You might want to jot down the phone number. It's 801-973-TV20. That's 973-8820. We also have a web page that you could go on. It's aboutpolygamy.com. Click the links, and it'll take you to other pages where there's more information about polygamy and products that you can order so that you excuse me, can learn more about polygamy. We also ask you if you have questions that you would like to ask off the air, you can email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com and we would be happy, be sure and uh, include your phone number and we'll be happy to call you back and answer your questions. For those of you tonight who may be watching who are in a polygamy group, I'd like to invite you to another web page. It's shieldandrefuge.org. That's shieldandrefuge.org. And on that uh, website, there are many pages that you can go to to find out about polygamy that you may have questions about. Maybe you're doubting something. And you can find that information there. There are, is a question and answer page. And if your questions aren't answered on that page, you can email uh, us and we will answer your question. There's informational pages and articles about polygamy. There's stories of people on that page, uh, of people who have left polygamy groups and they are living happy, productive lives. Yes, there is life after polygamy. And there's also a contact page and we would ask you to contact us off that page. Now, I was raised in a secretive polygamy group and I do know the fear and I know the perceived danger that you may have of contacting someone outside of the group for information. And so I assure you that any information or any contact that you make from that web page to us will be held in the strictest of confidence. Uh, we are receiving emails from this TV program and we appreciate that and we would appreciate more emails for, uh, to find out what you're thinking, what you would like to see perhaps in the future and we enjoy getting your email responses. Last week uh, we had announced that our special guest was a woman who had been raised in the LeBaron group, married when she was 15 years old and left after she'd had several children, Susan Schmidt. She had written a book about, or has written a book about her experiences, but Susan took ill this week and she wasn't able to come. She has agreed to come at a later date. We don't know exactly when yet that will be. And so we had to lean back to plan B. Now we know that you'll love plan B because she was on here last week and everybody loved her. And so I welcome and thank Mary Mackert with all my heart because <laughs> we needed her tonight. And she was so gracious to accept uh, the, the invitation to come and join us tonight. So welcome, Mary. Thank you so much for being here again. Thank you, Doris. I'm glad to be back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we talked a lot last week about our experiences in polygamy and yours particularly and of the FLDS El Dorado um, situation. But tonight I would like to perhaps compare uh, maybe a little more in depth 
our personal experiences, mm -hmm. you were raised in the FLDS group and I was raised in the Kingston group. Right. And maybe, if you don't mind, we can talk a little bit more about your personal experience as a married woman mm -hmm. in polygamy, if, if that's okay with that you. That would be fine. <laughs> Love to. Okay. Our telephone lines will be open. Uh, give us a call at 801-973-TV20, and uh, later on in the program we will be taking your telephone calls. And so, Mary, I guess the first question I would like to ask, um, and I'm trying to ask these according to the, the questions I get when I mm -hmm. go out and speak to groups, okay. and I'm sure you get the same questions. First of all, was there a pecking order among the men's wives? Um, if there was, did the men play on it for their own amusement or for, for their own um, agenda? Um, as far as a pecking order, in my particular experience, my husband tend to favor the women who worked a job and had money and their needs were met first. Then also, um, my experience was a little unique in that all of his wives, except me, were the daughters of apostles or the prophet. And so they had great clout. They had mm -hmm. an advocate, you might say. Uh -huh. <laughs> they had someone that if he was not, if they were not pleased with him, they could go to daddy and daddy could put pressure on him. Oh. I had no advocate. And so uh, as far as a pecking order, there were some preferences there. However, the unusual thing about my experience was I was the favorite wife. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> oh, no, it's not good. <laughs> no, <laughs> no oh, it's not well, good. Everybody know. thinks, oh, yay, she's the favorite. No, see, because if all things were equal, their perception would be that I had more. The other women would think that I had more. And so he always had to meet all of their needs uh -huh. and make sure they were uh -huh. happy before he could ever take care of my needs. Okay. And so in that respect, um, you didn't want to be the favorite wife. <laughs> and, and the same, it trickled down to my children. Yeah. They um, were, for lack of a better term, red-headed stepchildren, <laughs> you know, treated <laughs> like the lowest of the low mm -hmm. within the family. And did he use those things? Um, we had the famous no-talk rule at our house. The women couldn't talk among themselves. Other, you know, other than what it, we greeted each other. Good morning, how are you? Did you rest well? Yes. I mean, just superficial stuff, uh -huh. you know. But as far as if there was a problem, you had to go through him to get it corrected. Oh mm -hmm. And so um, you never knew what he was telling the other women. And, yeah. and they never knew what he was telling you. And there were times I caught him in lies. And uh -huh. so it was like, yeah, he played us so against they did each other. Manipulate, yeah, yeah. Some manipulation. Right. Uh, on a little bit on that same category, a little different, however, uh, I remember when I was still in the group, um, my mother especially, but also other women, mm -hmm. the minute that they found out, the very day that they discovered that they were for sure pregnant, they were in their maternity clothes because they wanted to parade it around oh the group <laughs> that they were pregnant. Uh -huh. And I think that was because their value was in their childbearing ability. Mm -hmm. And I think also it would uh, let everybody know, hey, I am loved. My husband does love me. He sees me once in a while. Oh, yeah. Did, did you find that in your group? Well, my husband lived a secretive lifestyle. And so we were not in the community where we were visible to everybody. Um, and, and pregnancy was a secret thing. We always wore our little pioneer dresses with these aprons over it. And when you became pregnant, it made it so you could unbutton some of the buttons down the front and mm -hmm. the apron covered mm -hmm. the gap as you mm -hmm. grew bigger and bigger. And he never would announce to the other women that you were pregnant till you were showing. Uh -huh. And so it was like this secret thing and you just you just kept it to yourself. And it was really hard yeah. to keep it a secret when you got morning sickness yeah. and I'm cooking yeah. and it's everything that I smell triggers that, you know. But you and you look green at the gills and it's like it it wasn't hard for us to figure out somebody else yeah. was pregnant. Probably my most horrific experience once I was pregnant with one of my children was I w went to bed early and I woke up to him bellow just bellering in the kitchen to the other women. Well, what do I have to do? Put it on the bulletin board. I slept with your sister last night. She might be oh, pregnant, you know, goodness. and I'm going, oh, no, oh. somebody's mad because I'm pregnant. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he swore up and down. It wasn't about me being pregnant. But the reason why I thought that was because 
some of the women thought you had to take turns at that kind of thing and it was somebody else's turn. I stepped out of turn. I got oh. pregnant before it was my turn and I think somebody was upset about it. But uh, it it's, was strange. It's it was interesting difficult. how different they are in the polygamy groups but I also believe that the differences are also in the families within the groups as oh, well yes. it seems to be. I found that to be true. Different men run their families different yeah, ways. They do and the wives. I oh, found yeah. that in my own experience. The, the family of the first wife was treated much better and mm -hmm. had much better um, material goods than we did, and that was the mother's oh, yes. situation. Mm -hmm. uh, many people ask, how did you deal with it when your husband uh, spent the nights with the other wives, and how did they deal with it, the other wives, when he was spending his nights with the others? I think people who ask this question just really don't understand. My marriage was arranged. I didn't love this guy, you know? <laughs> it was like, it was a business arrangement. You know, I give him sex, I get children, and I get to go to heaven. <laughs> so That's it's an like, exchange. You know, huh? it was an exchange. And any time I had any kind of jealousies or, or um, problems, uh, you know, along that line, it was like I always thought, well, they were all here before you. You know, what right do you have? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so I just kind of dismissed it that way and told myself, get over it, girl. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, that's, that's getting rid of your emotions. Mm -hmm. Viewers, if you have any questions, uh, remember that you can give us a call at 1 800 973 8820 TV20. Uh, Mary, did you notice that he had, and we kind of covered this in the first question about mm -hmm. the favorite children, if he had favorite children, and it, perhaps it would be too simplistic to say that they would be favorite because it was from a favorite wife, or maybe there would be a favoritism because it, he, the child was a boy or a girl, or because maybe it had a more the child had a more submissive attitude or personality. Or, did you find that um, in my family situation? Most of the time, uh, a child that got special attention um, had problems his mother couldn't handle. Uh, and so it was like he followed daddy around all the time because mom couldn't handle it. <laughs> and so it was like... Child would pick up on that pretty quick, wouldn't <laughs> Oh, <they? laughs> yeah, and they start to use it, you know. Uh, but uh, the, the favoritism pretty much um, had to do with who their mother was mm -hmm. and who their grandpa was. Oh, grandpa. Yeah, mm -hmm. grandpa was the apostle mm -hmm. or the prophet. So mm -hmm. it's like um, they had, they had uh, things that my kids didn't have. And my kids would ask all the time, well, why does so-and-so get to do this? Or why do they get to have that? And why do I get told no all the time? I had no answers for them. It was just the way it happened. Mm -hmm. I think my mother purposely made sure we weren't the favorite because she didn't want us to have that attention. Mm. I'm going to move along more to the spiritual matters. Um, while you were in the group, uh, while and actually we're, we can have a discussion with this so that mm -hmm. we both of our experiences can be included. Uh, while we were in the group, um, our transition out and then our, our transition after we left the group, uh, first of all, did anyone ever talk to you or witness to you about biblical truth while you were in the group? And if they did, how did you react to it? I never heard about salvation by grace till four years after I had left. I mean, it, it was totally, that whole thought, was just totally foreign to me. I grew up with a God who was wrathful and lived in fear that I would step out of line and be a char spot on the floor. You know, I, uh, I, uh, God was so big and scary and, mm -hmm. and, uh, nobody I really wanted to know, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I just hoped, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the less I heard from God, the better it was, you know, it was kind of like, no news is good news, and if I don't hear from God, then I must be doing all right, you know, because yeah, yeah. lightning hadn't hit me yet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? I often wondered about that myself, yeah. and for my own answer to that question, no one ever witnessed to me about the truth of the Bible, uh, the truth of Jesus, the true gospel. I never knew about God's love at all, mm -hmm. and of course, that's part of my testimony. Um, but uh, like you, no one told me the truth about what we needed to know, mm -hmm. the, the true salvation. Right. Um, most of the active polygamists that I talk with refuse to believe that biblical evidence 
that polygamy is not God's will and is not part of his salvation plan. What would you say to these people about that? Because we now, we've done our own Bible studies and mm -hmm. we know right. that uh, polygamy is not part of God's salvation plan, but the re polygamists absolutely refuse to believe it. They believe if people lived it in the Bible, it's got to be okay. Right. What, what do you say to these? Well, there are lots of things in the Bible that aren't okay. That's for Incest, sure. rape, murder. Certainly we would agree that those things are not of God, but he's, they're put in the Bible to teach us valuable lessons. And I believe the stories of polygamy that are in the Bible teach valuable lessons. And one of those things that you know, uh, it, first of all, God never commanded it. You never right. find a command in the Bible for men to live polygamy. In right. fact, in the New Testament, you'll find that, that God says that a man is to be the husband of one wife. Right. And each wife is to be, um, uh, have one, her own husband, and every husband is to have his own right. wife. Mm -hmm. And so you do find commands that way for monogamy, but mm -hmm. you don't for polygamy. And I, I say, well, let's look at the fruit of polygamy. When you look at Sarah and Hagar, mm -hmm. we have a religious war going on today that is the fruit of that polygamist mm -hmm. situation. That's right. And when you look at, at Rachel and Leah, the bitterness between those women, they bartered over who yeah, that's would awful. sleep with him. Dysfunctional family. Yeah. Not? And a bitterness, uh, Leah fought very hard to make sure that her sons, her oldest son, would receive the inheritance and mm -hmm. all those kind of things, mm -hmm. even though she knew Rachel was his favorite. And the sexual sin that went on in that family oh, yes. as well yes. as a result of this. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and so when you look at the fruit of polygamy, it's never good fruit. That's right, absolutely right. And my answer to that question is that basically on the same lines as uh, what Mary has said. Yes, there are righteous men, God-fearing men in the Bible who did practice polygamy. And some of these men also practiced, like Mary mentioned, incest, murder, rape. Some of them even practiced idolatry, which God calls spiritual adultery. But all of these are sins, and God never commanded nor condoned any of them, just like he didn't command nor condone polygamy. Um, the, the main question that I would ask about this is polygamy in God's salvation plan. You won't find it in the Bible. The salvation plan is very clear and very simple, and it never included polygamy. Mm, that's true. The next question, uh, we hear a lot about the word gospel. Mm -hmm. As I was doing my Bible studies, I, and I, in the beginning, when I first mm -hmm. started s studying in the Bible, I discovered that the word gospel was an old English word that meant good news. Mm -hmm. Each religion, it seems, has what they call their gospel. Mm -hmm. the, the, each church and each different religion has that. What was the gospel for your church, for your religion? And in your religion, was there any unforgivable sins? And if so, what were they? The gospel of the FLDS was polygamy. You had to live polygamy. It was required of you to, for your salvation and exaltation. Mm -hmm. The exaltation part being becoming a god. Right. And um, the other part of salvation was obedience to all the commandments and the ordinances of the gospel. Well, the commandments, were, I mean, you're going to have to go through, I mean, what are there, over 600 in the Bible? Yeah, and, and then there's the Book of Mormon, and then there's the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price, and on and on and on it goes. I don't, I don't think I knew what all the commandments were, so how could I obey them how all? How could you know? Right. How could I know? And, and so there were definitely some that I didn't obey just out of ignorance. And so there was no security in salvation mm -hmm. from the, the religion I was taught. The unforgivable sins were apostasy and infidelity. And then also revealing sacred things which pertain yes. to temple yes. ordinances and stuff like that, which we did not have. We hoped one day we would be mm -hmm. worthy of. But um, apostasy, turning away from what you believed and were taught, turning against our religion mm -hmm. was an unforgivable sin. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the way we were taught as well. Um, I think the interesting thing about all this is the gospel, according to the Kingston groups, basically was, was two things, the same as yours, and that is live polygamy 
and the second part being live the United Order 100 percent. The, the United Order is you consecrate everything that you own or ever will own to the group and it belongs to them and then it's consecrated for God's use. Um, so that was the gospel according to the Kingston group. However, I'd like to make mention here that that is not good news. That's mm -hmm. bad news. <laughs> Uh, the unforgivable sins uh, for, that I learned about was infidelity, which I think is interesting in a polygamy group, <laughs> that that could be an unforgivable sin. Murder was an unforgivable sin. Leaving the group never to return, which is apostasy, basically the same mm -hmm. as yours. And if we talked about the secrets of the group to anybody outside, and uh, that talk led to problems or led to arrests or destruction of the group, that was mm -hmm. an unforgivable sin as well. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that our groups are really pretty much the same with very little um, differences. Right. Remember, folks, you are welcome to call us at 973-TV20. That's 973-8820. We will be opening up the telephone lines pretty soon to take your calls. Um, I hear many people who have escaped polygamy and they say that they want absolutely nothing to do with God. And that's the way I felt when I left. I was sick and tired of his perceived hold on my life. And I was taught that God was so negative and so vengeful, I didn't want to have anything to do with him. And of course, as I've mentioned many times, mm -hmm. I was never told he loved me. How did you view God slash Jesus while you were still in the group? Mm -hmm. when you left the group and five years after you left the group mm -hmm. and now. So I'm just trying to get your spiritual uh, evolution right, here. Right. When I uh, was a part of the FLDS, I feared God. He was very impersonal. I even doubted if he really existed. And um, in two instances before I left, God showed himself to me in a very powerful way. He healed uh, uh, one of the children that I was caring for through my prayers because oh, wow. my husband refused to allow me to take him to the doctor. The doctor said he would die if he did not get very serious, strong antibiotics. He had an infection in his hip bone. Mm -hmm. And um, through prayer, God brought people into my life who helped me minister to this child in um, home remedy kind of ways. Mm -hmm. But I know God put his healing hand on that child through my prayers wow. and crying out to him. And, and in that way, I, I was amazed and I marveled at the fact that that great, big, huge, fearful, impersonal God heard my prayers and answered. And then also, um, my youngest child, before I uh, was pregnant with him, I had miscarried and it was a great heartache to me. I'd always wanted to have a little girl and I have five boys. And when I miscarried with this little girl, I started to feel sorry for myself. And a big tear rolled down my face and, and mu fell into my ear and muffled the sound. And I heard God say, don't cry. I'm gonna give you a child. I'm gonna give you a very special child. And even as Mary hid the news of that she would bear the Christ child in her heart. I hid that secret in my heart and I waited on God. Hmm. And my husband was impotent at the time and God was faithful and he wow. did it. And, and he became very real to me. Hmm. I believed he, he loved me and he cared about me. It was knowing that that helped me to flee wow. and know that I would be safe even though I was terrified of the mm -hmm. world out there and had been told that everything out there was wicked and evil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, after I left, there were people who tried to witness to me and I would push them away because it was religion and I didn't want right. any more religion. Yeah, been there. <laughs> but, but I still prayed um, and I, 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 just didn't, I, I just didn't trust religion. Mm -hmm. And God brought me to a place where he showed me that he loved me, he died for me, he wanted to spend eternity with me, which wow. was a hard thing even today for me to fathom why God would want to spend eternity with vile, wicked me, <laughs> you know? And, but he did. Mm -hmm. and, and I have come to know 
um, I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior four years after I left. So when you want the five-year increment, and now they're there kind of the go. same. Okay, wow. Well. And, and I learned through reading the Bible that Jesus is God. Uh-huh. He is God. He gave himself for me. And what greater love is there? than when you give yourself for someone else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's just uh, awesome stories. I, I just love to hear uh, how people come to know the truth that God has given us so uh, faithfully in the Word. Um, when I was still in the group, I was scared to death of God, and I really did not like Him because He didn't like me. <laughs> and that's what I had heard all the time. And so uh, when I was getting ready to leave the group, uh, He was even more scary because I did leave. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I thought He was really was going to come after me now. And I, I almost was looking behind my shoulder, wondering when He was going to zap me. And it never did happen. And I I'll often wondered about that, <clears throat> but I didn't want to look into it. <laughs> I didn't want to stir it up. And then five years after I left, God seemed to be a little bit less scary because he hadn't moved in right. on my life in that vengeful way. Uh, and yet he wasn't desirable to me. I didn't desire to know him. Uh, again, I had had no witness from any Christians. And I know I met a lot of Christians during that time, but no one witnessed to me about the truth of God and the Bible and salvation. And I was afraid to know God's will. I was afraid to even try to, to find his will. Mm -hmm. I was afraid he would tell me to go back to the polygamy group or something like that. And so I didn't. I didn't pay any attention to it. Now, God, I recognize, I think one of the most fascinating, exciting things I found in the Bible was that Jesus is God mm -hmm. and that he is the Savior, that he died on the cross for me. And so now I love God. Uh, I am so grateful that God is who he is. And I'm so grateful that he is not <laughs> who I thought he was. <laughs> right. We have some calls coming in. I think maybe before we go on with the questions, we can take some calls. Uh, line one, we have Diana from Sandy. Hello, Diana. Hi. Um, I have a question for you. I, I, this is Doris, right? This is Doris. Uh -huh. Okay. And I hear you talking about you were raised in polygamy. Uh -huh. I wondered if you also were married into it. I was not married into it. I was slated to be married to someone who had claimed me at birth and it repelled me and so I ran away when I turned 18 so it couldn't happen. Mary was married into it but I wasn't. Okay and then I have another question and I don't know if it's appropriate to answer on this or not. I hear a lot about inbreeding in the polygamous groups and I wondered if that was true or if it's like just some of the groups or is it typical or? Uh, inbreeding does take place uh, especially in the group that I'm from. I think it takes place in, to a certain degree in the other groups but probably not as close as the ones uh, that I am from. Uh, there is a shallow gene pool and so it does happen uh, and there are problems as a result from it. Okay. All right. I love your program. I really especially love hearing about how you and Mary heard about the truth. That is just so special. That is really <laughs> neat to hear about that. It is special to us, too, to, to know the truth right. after we've been raised in such a lie. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh-huh. Good night. Okay, let's take Rose in North Ogden, line two. Hello, Rose. Rose, hello. Yes. Um, I had a question. Um, I know that the LDS um, came from the, um, the the same teaching. Is that correct, Joseph Smith? And so F LDS are all kind of one of the same till they changed their minds and wrote new um, rules. My question is, why is it that the LDS church today does not go to the um, polygamous um, places and talk to their leaders and say, this is wrong. What, what you're doing is wrong and, and have been taught. Is that because they don't want to um, admit their wrong teaching or they just want to, they're ashamed? and they just want to pretend that these people don't exist. Um, and um, 
I think my second question was, what about the dysfunction? There, there has to be dysfunction in these families. Children have to um, see that this is not right. There's more than one mother. Um, it, it, it can't be healthy. How is that addressed to the children? How is it dealt with? Okay. Um, Rose, I'll let uh, Mary take this question for okay. you. Rose, I want to say, first of all, I, I can't speak for the LDS Church as to why they would not reach out to the uh, FLDS or any other polygamous group other than uh, it's a part of their history that uh, from all that has happened and over the years, I believe they're trying to separate themselves from. And so in that respect, it for them to approach the polygamous people and try to win them back to the mainstream Mormon church would reconnect them with their history and I don't believe that they want to do that. Um, the other part of your question, uh, I'm sorry, I, I think I had a senior the, moment. The, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope I didn't. Uh, the, she wanted to know if the children in the polygamy groups uh, don't recognize that there's something wrong with their with this lifestyle that they're having so many mothers. Right. Well, you're, you're so secluded from it. In fact, I was even taught that um, I, I pitied the people in the world. We were taught to pity the people in the world who only had one mother because I had three. And it was like, if anything happened to my mother, I was told there were, there were these other women who would love me and take care of me. In reality, that's not true. Because every one, woman loves her child first right. and foremost. Mm -hmm. And so you only become second best to those other women and you will always only be second best. So um, that, uh, lie that they're told. Uh, yeah. um, well, I just want to say God bless you ladies and I'm thankful that you're with the Lord. Thank the you. True. Thank you, Rose. We appreciate your call. Have a good evening. Thank you. Uh -huh. Good night. Okay, we have on line three, we have Diane from Murray. Hello, Diane. Hello, Doris. Hi, you're on the air. Oh, thank you. I have a question, please. Just out of my own curiosity, if an individual in the group professed um, homosexual tendencies, was did they dare, first of all, to profess this orientation? If they did, or if it was suspected by other members of the group, how was this handled? Were they forced into a marriage anyway, ignored, um, exiled, admonished? Just, I, I just wonder how this would be handled. Um, you know, Diane, I don't recall ever having that situation in the group that I'm from. Um, I'm not sure that it hasn't happened, but I never did see that take place, so I don't know how they handled it or would have handled it. Uh, Mary, do you have an answer to that? Um, I really didn't have any experience, you might say, with, with somebody confessing or professing to be homosexual. Uh, the closest thing that came to that was I found out after I left that my husband had molested my boys. And uh, that was a shocking thing. Uh, it was heart-wrenching. Um, we were taught that things like that were wicked and evil sins. And today it, we're, we're all told that you're genetically predisposed this way. Nobody when I was growing up was genetically predisposed. <laughs> and so... Um, it was not something that uh, we ever addressed, and it certainly would have been shunned, and and uh, somebody would have been um, chastised or reprimanded for that kind of behavior. Thank you very much for taking my call. That was just my personal curiosity. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for calling. We appreciate sure, your call. Well. Uh huh. Enjoy your show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, bye bye. Mm -hmm, bye. We do have a question uh, that someone has, has called and asked and they want it to be answered off the air. And the question is, do you think that the children should be returned to the families in El Dorado? We did discuss this in quite a bit of depth last week, but we can answer that question again. Uh, Mary, do you want to take that or do you? Uh, I'd love to address that question. The children have already been returned to El Dorado to their parents, which is a, a curious thing to me because um, while I was down in El Dorado, and spoke with volunteers and CPS workers, I was told that these women would not identify who were their children. They would not claim their children. And when they 
watched the behavior of these children and they looked like this little child was hanging by this one woman and maybe that was her child and they would ask them the woman would respond oh no I'm just a caretaker and so this is why the DNA testing had to be done mm -hmm. it, it it's expensive and it's time-consuming and it was all because these women would not claim their own children so my big question for the courts was, how can we send children back to parents who won't claim them? And so um, I've, uh, that's my big puzzle. Um, I know that, that they are uh, examining the DNA evidence, and uh, I anticipate that there will be um, evidence brought forth and uh, people prosecuted for illegal behavior. And there is a uh, grand jury investigation that has begun already in El Dorado. And another uh, remark, another note on that, uh, is that um, the children were out into that big bad world that they were taught that was evil and that hated them. And they were out of that, into that world who actually loved them and took care of them and nurtured them for about six weeks. And so they learned that the world doesn't hate them, that there is fun out there and there is enjoyment and it was safe. Uh, what they're being told when they're back at the ranch, we don't have any idea. But I do believe that they had an experience out in the world they should have had and that they otherwise would not have had. So that would be the answer to our question. We do have on line one Leroy. We don't know what city he's in, but we'll talk to Leroy. Good evening, Leroy. Hi, Dorothy. Hey, I, I've got a couple. Did you study the Book of Mormon? I read the Book of Mormon when I was growing up, yes. Okay. Um, I got out of the LDS Church uh, four or five years ago, and when I read the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> Jacob chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, there's two reasons why you don't practice polygamy. Do you, do you know those reasons? Well, I know it says it's an abomination before the Lord. Well, yeah, that's a doctrine and covenants, 132nd. Yeah, yeah, I just said that. I'm sorry. You uh -huh. did say that. The reason why you don't practice polygamy, it breaks the heart of the wife and lose the confidence of the children. Now, uh, four, four more sentences down, then it says to raise a seed uh, otherwise, okay? Uh -huh. so if, if you read your Book of Mormon, I have read it. Evil person practice polygamy. King Noah. Not one person in the Book of Mormon ever practice polygamy, okay? Now, in the 132nd Doctrine and Covenants, um, it says only if God gives you those wives. Did God tell your prophets that God told them to give them your husbands to you? Is that, is that what they did? Well, Leroy, I would have to uh, remark on that, that God has not commanded nor condoned polygamy, so he is not going to give wives multiple wives to one man. The uh, Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery is when you have sexual relations with someone who is not your single spouse. Therefore, God is not going to give a man the right to commit adultery. He doesn't go against that, himself. That's 100% that's correct. And in the Articles of Faith, this is what it said in the Articles of Faith, that we believe, they believe in obeying all law, laws, kings, dictators, and when Joseph Smith started having his 33 wives, he was committing adultery That's right. because they weren't legal. And there was the, many of his wives, I think 11 of them already had a living husband. So no, there's yeah, no question cool. of the yeah. adultery. Do you have anything yeah. to say about that, Mary? Or? No, I think you've covered it <laughs> quite well. <laughs> okay, thank you, Leroy, for calling. Bye. Uh -huh. Bye. Okay, line two is Jody. He's sh also, she's also from an unknown city. Hello, Jody. Yes, you're on the air. Okay, I was just wondering how many LDS prophets and FLDS prophets are the same. Uh, would you repeat that? How many LDS prophets and FLDS prophets are the same? Joseph Smith, Brigham Young. Oh, oh, clear up to the manifesto. The manifesto. Uh, which would be who, John Wilford, Taylor? Wilford, Wilford would, would have signed the manifesto. Okay, so it would be clear up to them, and then when the manifesto was signed, the splinter group started, and uh, the polygamy groups had their own prophets because they believed the LDS mainline church had gone apostate. Okay, thank you. You're mm -hmm. welcome. Good night. 
Okay, line three, we have Sam from Spanish Fork. Hello, Sam. Okay. Hi. Yeah, uh, first, I want to say bless your hearts for what you're doing, both of you. Thank you. And uh, the, Rose called in a little while ago, and maybe my statement might help her question a little bit about why the LDS Church doesn't uh, want to deal with polygamy. So what I was saying was that uh, I think one of the reasons is it's still part of their doctrine in their temple ceremony. Yes, it is. And uh, so they probably want to stay away from that. And that's, uh, I mean, I just got one more statement. The LDS people can rationalize all they want, but it was really Joseph Smith that got the whole cancerous thing going, I think, don't you? It was Joseph mm -hmm. Smith that started it and Brigham Young who propagated it from that point. So, uh, yeah, they, the, the two then, main prophets of the Mormon Church. It was, uh, you know, I think it was the final straw back there in uh, Nauvoo that led to his death and Hiram's. And they, I think it caused much, if not most, of the persecution to those people. It certainly was a big part of it. Yes, it was. Thank you, Sam, for calling. You bet you bye. Uh -huh, bye. Um, we have one more question that someone wants us to a answer uh, on the air. Um, do, do children get proper nurturing if parents don't love each other? Is there ever outbreaks of STDs within polygamy groups due to multiple partners? Well, those are two separate questions. Okay, we'll answer them separately. Do children get po proper nurturing if parents don't love each other? Um, I'll speak for my family, and then, of course, Mary can speak with her for her own. Um, I did not, our family did not get proper nurturing at all. My mother was lonely, and she had a huge burden with a growing family. My father in the early years was there very infrequently and um, the frustrations that my mother suffered was taken out on us. Uh, our, our whole burden was to grow up to be productive for the group. We were not nurtured as children should be nurtured with love. I don't remember ever being told I was loved when I was growing up by anyone. Um, so the proper nurturing, no, there's no way it can happen, especially with these huge families. Some of these polygamous families are, uh, have 16 to 18 children, and there's uh, from one woman, but when you've got a lot of women, that's a lot of children. Mm -hmm. So do you want to pick that one up? Yes. Last week we talked about the, the mother bear syndrome and how it was made a sin for a woman to defend her child. And uh, right, that right there uh, hampers proper nurturing. Uh, and as, as much as my mother tried and, and struggled to uh, love and care for her children and bring them up uh, so that they would be secure and happy and healthy, um, she was hampered all the time by the, the fact that she had to be absolutely obedient to my father, who was mol molesting us. You know, so it's like, what do you do? You're, um, you're she was bound by the, the group to be obedient to him and, and could not defend her children. And so, uh, it, yeah, when they don't mm -hmm. love each other, it really uh, hurts the, the nurturing and caring that needs to take place for children. And when they're doing their duty, so to speak, it's, it's their duty to live polygamy, it's their duty to have multiple children, and it's their duty to swallow your pain of sharing your husband. Doing your duty just precludes all love. Mm -hmm. you, you can't do your duty and have that love um, in this, at the same time in a polygamy situation. It just doesn't happen. Uh, the next question, uh, are there ever outbreaks of STDs within polygamy groups due to multiple partners? I've never heard of it, have you? Well, um, because they're, they're exclusive with their husband, each woman, and he's not out shopping around out where he might pick up an STD in most cases. <laughs> I didn't see any of that. Probably the biggest thing that ever happened was uh, maybe um, Candida got passed around. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, it, it's not like he's out prowling the streets looking for somebody, though my dad was promiscuous in those ways too. And, uh, uh, but um, to my knowledge, there wasn't any STD problem that was going on. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it either. Okay, we have a call coming in from Karen in Salt Lake City on line one. Karen? Hello, Karen? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, what is your question? Hi, <laughs> yes. Um, my, uh, my question is, um, I was just wondering where all the men are in all this when they were showing the 
footage in El Dorado, you know, they had all those women out there, but there weren't any men. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering in the latest trial that they had here, I was thinking it was the Kingston family, which was just told it was the Jessups, but there was one man that they showed on TV, but I wondered how many other men there were, and there, are there any men who have left and would come forward to talk like you guys are when they realized that what they were doing wasn't right? And I was just curious. I mean, we see all the women stepping forward, but these men are nowhere to be seen. That <clears throat> is extremely true. Um, they're, the men are there somewhere, like Mary mentioned last week. A lot of them are hiding behind the women's skirts. Um, the, we've tried to get men who would even come on the program and be uh, interviewed. I do have a couple that are coming up. Uh, to be interviewed, unfortunately, with the one we're having in a couple of weeks, well, not unfortunately, he didn't live polygamy, and that's <laughs> fortunate, but yes. we don't have an ex-polygamous man yet that has come forward, hoping it will happen soon. Do you have anything you want to say to that? Uh, no, the, uh, just like I said last week, these men are hiding behind the skirts of the women, and uh, a, a lot of it, you got to understand, is fear of prosecution and uh, and uh, I know with my husband, when I married him, I was 17 and he was 50. And the, you won't find a picture of the bride and the groom together because it would have been evidence against him and he could have spent a lot of time in jail mm -hmm. because in Utah it would have been rape of a child. And so, um, yeah, I, the, with the El Dorado thing, that was my thing too. It's like, where are the men? Where are mm -hmm. the men? A lot of people ask uh, that question. Yeah. Yeah, can I ask you, how do you deal with the resentment and hate? Uh, I just feel this coming up in, in, inside of me that I just want to go and do something. And, I mean, where do you put it? The resentment and hate towards the system or between the polygamists, be, toward the man? What, where is that? All the above. You know, <laughs> it, it, it all works together. It's the men, it's the doctrine. It, yeah. You know, yeah. it's powerlessness a, that these people are living in, and a lot of them are even unaware that they're in bondage. You know. Well, you could you could write to the attorney general. You could write letters to the editor. You can make your voice be heard. Uh, there are ways that you can do that. Uh, of course, hatred is not the way to do it. We need to do it uh, with the truth, and that's what we're trying to do: is bring out the truth of all of this, and do to do it in love, not to do it in hatred or bitterness, but. To do it to, with the alternative. The alternative is love through Jesus Christ. That's mm -hmm. the only That's right. alternative mm -hmm. that would get rid of our bitterness and our hatred. That's uh, the only thing that healed us. Uh, Karen, the only thing that it, that it can heal is is uh, <coughs> laying it at the foot of the cross. And and the God is in control, and uh, He hears our prayers and He answers, and and. Uh, Oh, that's where I got rid of my bitterness and my anger about all that had been done to me and against me was to leave it at the cross mm -hmm. and know that God's going to take care of it and heal it. Okay, thank okay. you, and God bless you both. Thank you, Beverly, for your call. Bye-bye. Uh-huh, bye. Okay, we have a call from Beverly in West Valley on line two. Hello, Beverly. Hi. Hi, yes, you're um, on the air. I really enjoy your show. I'm learning an awful lot from you, too. Oh, good. That's good to hear. Um, I have another question about the men. Um, when I mean, if they ever do decide that they just can't handle it anymore and they leave, they abandon ship, do they get accepted into the LDS church? Do they end up there? Or whatever happens to these men? And I'll take my answer off the air. Okay. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you. Uh-huh. Night. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of people who will leave the, uh, the polygamy groups and join the LDS church. Uh, yes, the LDS church does accept them, uh, but there, there are times when the LDS church wants to be very sure that they are not using them to be baptized and then go back to the polygamy groups because they believe that they use them to get their seatings done in their temple or and their baptism's done, and then uh, once they've got it done, they'll go back to their polygamy group. So that's another can of worms that we won't really dig into tonight, but that is a concern that I know is going on. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who will leave polygamy groups and turn to the Mormon church, and yet it's the same 
prophet, Joseph Smith, that started all of this mess, and I don't understand that thinking. Would you like to add to that? Well, I've had uh, uh, family, brothers who have left and are now born-again Christians, and uh, that thrills my soul that, that they could see the, the, um, the error of what they were taught and, and turn to Jesus Christ and, and trust Him with their eternity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we have another question, Mary. This one's for you. What is the name of your book and where can they get it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my book is entitled The Six of Seven Wives, Escape from Modern Day Polygamy. And uh, I've been selling that on Amazon. However, when their inventories run out, I'm not giving them any more books. I'm down to 600 books. You can get it on my website at www.x, just the letter x, polygamous.com. And um, at any speaking engagements that I'm involved with, you can purchase the book there. But those are the only two places after Amazon runs out of their inventory. <laughs> oh, and good. I am working on a second edition and more books. So once I get me a publisher lined up, we'll have more books available for you. That's, that's Thank good you. news that you're running out of books. Uh, we still do have a few minutes left. And Mary, before <clears throat> we get to the close of the program, I do have a question that I think is important for us to, to both look at what happened with us. Uh, like we mentioned before, the last thing on this planet that I wanted when I left the group was to be involved with the God thing. Mm -hmm. And I had had enough of him, and I had had enough of his ruthless demands while I was in the group that I didn't want anything to do with him for 25 years after mm -hmm. I left. However, God wanted me to know certain things um, that I needed to know before I would turn to him. And I'm, I'm going to name four things that I needed to know that God used to, to get me to where I would look at the truth and then turn to him. The first thing I needed to know was that he loved me. I had never heard that before. The second thing I needed to know was that the LDS church nor any polygamy group was the only two tr true church on the planet, which they both claimed to be. The third thing I needed to know was that the Bible was a true document that could be trusted. And the fourth thing was that salvation is by grace, mm -hmm. through faith, mm -hmm. not by works. <laughs> <laughs> and when I researched these four things, and I did research them, and I discovered they were factual, then I turned my life over to God, and I've not regretted a moment of it. Mm -hmm. So in a couple of minutes, can you explain your four things or five? Maybe you had six oh. things that you needed to know. One of the first things for me was that I, I needed to know that God was real, that he wasn't a fairy tale, he wasn't made up, that he was as real as you, as you sitting right there, that he had to be that real for me, and he showed himself to me to be real. I needed to know that he loved me. Mm -hmm. There was so little love in my life. I needed to know that I was loved. And the third thing, I needed to know that he wanted me, that, that he desired me and, and delighted in me. Yes. Those things, when I found out those things, I really believed the Bible to be the Word of God. And as I start, began to study those things and found out those things, then I could trust him with my eternity mm -hmm. because he was real mm -hmm. and he loved me. And he wanted me. I was something desirable that he wanted. And all he wanted was my heart. Right. I didn't have to suffer and go through agony and uh, s sacrifice and give up things. Mm -hmm. I just had to trust him. And he just wanted my heart. That's what he wants is our trust. Yeah. Is and... Mormonism made me a big part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. And guilt was he heaped on me for being disobedient, disobedient to the plan. And then I was always told how I hurt others because I didn't line up with the plan and didn't do what I was supposed to. But I found out that all of that was just controlling stuff. Mm -hmm. It was not what God wanted from me. He just wanted my heart. And I think that's the amazing thing when you learn about God, that He is so different than the wrathful, vengeful God that we learn about in the non-biblical uh, groups that claim they're the only way to salvation. 
Uh, one thing I'd like to say about that is when you study an issue, if you're trying to prove something is right or wrong, you can't do it just by studying one side of the issue. You've got to study opposing sides, and then you need, need to weigh the evidence. Uh, and, and I find as I talk to people, especially in the polygamy groups, that they weigh one side of the issue and not the other side. They just don't want to know whether mm -hmm. or not it's true because uh, you can't really find out truth unless you weigh the opposing issues as well. Um, I would like to, um, let's see, we have one more question we'll have to take quickly. We only have a couple of minutes. Do the polygamists have the same endowment ceremony in their temples as the mainstream Mormon church? We did not have a temple, so we did not have any endowment ceremonies at all. Well, and the FLDS, they did not um, get a temple until El Dorado when Warren Jeffs moved them out there. Uh, in our marriage ceremonies, the uh, secret handshake that uh, is performed in the LDS temple, is, it, I understand that. I've been told that by people who've been there, okay? Was the same as the, ha the secret handshake that we um, did during our marriage ceremonies. So those are the similarities there. Okay, um, we will have a special guest next week. Um, if you've seen Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, there is a comment made by Mary that says that she picked up her child and whirled him around and said, Hallelujah, I have a son who doesn't know who Joseph Smith is. And that is our guest next week. Ben Draper will be here to share his story of being raised in a polygamy group but not as uh, living polygamy. Um, we would like to thank you for coming tonight. Uh, for joining us. Thank you, Mary, for filling in the void that Susan <laughs> was not able to keep. Yeah. I want to remind all women out there who have been told that getting married or who you marry has something to do with your salvation and your eternity. It does not. That is not true. There's not a shred of biblical evidence for that. Salvation is through Jesus Christ and through Him alone. He died on the cross for your sins. He didn't bleed in the garden for your sins. He died on the cross for your sins and he is the way to salvation. Titus 3, 5, and 6 says that he saved us because of his mercy that he poured out on us, not for any good things that we have done, and that's the truth of salvation. Remember, God has spoken. Each man is to have his own wife. Each woman is to have her own husband. Thank you for sharing your evening with us. God bless, and good night.